question. Um, so I'll try to multitask as I introduce the speaker. So thank you very much, Daniel, and sorry for tweeting that message. I think many of you may have seen this, but uh, he sent a tweet, tweet ask, offering a talk, and I thought it was a fantastic idea, so I jumped on the opportunity. Um, I am a professor of psychological sciences, math, neuroscience, and psychiatry at University of Connecticut. I'm the director of the Brain Imaging Research Center at as well at University of Connecticut, and I have an adjunct position at UCSF. Um, and I'm, I apologize, I'm distracted a little bit because of trying to admit people as they come in. But um, so thank you very much for being here. We canceled our in-person uh, speaker series, so we are grateful that you're offering this virtual seminar. And it's, if successful, and it seems like it is already based on the people who are joining every second, um, that um, we will continue to have this. And we were just talking with Daniel that maybe Daniel can nominate someone after this talk and we can continue to have sort of this, everyone nominates each other and we would host this kind of uh, virtual seminar series. I apologize, my son just threw up and then the younger one is striking for not having doing piano anymore. And then my 86 year old mother-in-law just joined from her senior home that had COVID cases. So I'm a little distracted here, but we wanna get going. So Daniel, thank you very much. Uh, Daniel, Professor Daniel Ansari received his PhD from University College of London in 2003. Presently, Daniel Ansari is a professor in Canada Research Chair in Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience in the Department of Psychology and the Brain and Mind Institute at the University of Western Ontario in London. Uh, where he and he is heading the numerical cognition laboratory and sorry and his team explores the developmental trajectory underlying both the typical and atypical development of numerical and mathematical skills using both behavioral neuroimaging methods. He has received a number of awards from many um, institutions, uh, many organizations, including the Association for Psychological Sciences, as uh, well as the British Dyslexia Association. And also he is known as one of the legends and the father of the mind, brain, and education, educational neuroscience field. So we are grateful to have um, such a high profile speaker for this occasion. So Daniel, thank you very much. I'll mute myself. Great, thanks very much for Miko. It's, it's really nice to be here. Although these are of course very unusual times and I'm sure everybody is uh, struggling with all sorts of things. Uh, um, but uh, at least we're all in the in the same boat. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to um, um, sort of pick up on something that you said, Fumiko, about mind, brain, and education. Yesterday, we heard that unfortunately Kurt Fisher uh, passed away, who was the the founder of the Harvard um, School of Education, mind, brain, and education program, and also the the, the founder of the International Mind, Brain and Education Society, as well as the journal Mind, Brain and Education. So uh, it's been a been a big loss, I think, I think for our field. So um, just uh, raising that, sparing a thought for Kurt and, and, and his family and everybody who worked with him. Some of you uh, online um, have probably met with him and, and talked to him, been inspired by his work. So uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, to talk a little bit about our work and the work of others around um, how we process numbers and numerical symbols in particular. But before I begin, I think it's, it's useful to put the field of numerical co cognition into a context. I think it's fair to say that over the past uh, uh, three or more decades, we've made tremendous progress in understanding how children learn to read. And the science of reading is, at least in my estimation, a real uh, success story when it comes to translating uh, from psychological as well as cognitive neuroscience research into education. Uh, by education, I don't just mean how we teach children how to read, but also how we identify children who might be at risk of reading difficulties. Uh, so that's been a real success story, although some debates still rage on, but uh, for the most part, I think that's a real success story of the field of mind, brain, and education, or the science of learning, translating what we know about how children learn and develop into applications. When it comes to children's development of numerical skills, I think we're still uh, a ways behind uh, the science of reading, although tremendous progress has been made. 
uh, including by many of you uh, on this on this call today. And I want to focus on some of that progress and also highlight some of the open questions and debates that we have that I think are scientifically uh, applicable, but also have practical applications. What I want to focus on in particular, and I think this is where the field of numerical cognition has taken great inspiration from uh, what we learn, uh, what we know about uh, the science of reading, is to focus very much on foundational competencies and to ask ourselves questions about what are the early foundations of numeracy and what is scaffolding uh, children's numerical and mathematical uh, development early on. So we sort of can take an analogy, if you like, to phonological awareness. Uh, we know that phonological awareness is a really critical predictor. So in other words, uh, people in my lab and in many labs around the world have been trying to sort of hunt for the phonological awareness equivalent or equivalence in the domain of numeracy. And in this search for foundational competencies, competencies there's been a lot of emphasis on how we process um, uh, sets of items in the world around us. This is sometimes referred to as uh, non-symbolic representations of number because you can uh, look at this and form some estimate in your mind of how many dots there are on this page without having to count them. Um, and you can do so without reference necessarily to a numerical symbol. And this notion that uh, there is a pre-existing uh, uh, sort of representation of numerical quantity is supported by evidence from nonverbal human infants, where work has shown for several decades now that uh, very young babies can discriminate between dot arrays in a traditional habituation, dishabituation uh, design. So famously, Shu and Spelke in 2000 showed that infants can discriminate uh, six-month-old infants can discriminate between eight and 16 dots, but not between eight and 12 dots, sort of suggesting that they have some sense of numerosity, but it's a very approximate or coarse sense of numerosity. This idea has also been uh, substantiated by lots and lots of work, uh, too much here to go into detail with uh, non-human primates and other species, showing that non-human primates can also discriminate between non-symbolic quantities or sets of items. For example, here in this cartoon image was sort of inspired by Jessica Cantlon and Liz Brannan's work. Monkeys were able to touch the numerically smaller array before touching the numerically larger array. And they were also able to generalize from training sets to numbers that they hadn't seen before. And from cognitive neuroscience research, uh, from single cell uh, neurophysiological recordings by people like Andreas Nieder and others, all the way up to functional MRI studies. We know that areas in and around the interparietal sulcus are very important for coding for uh, quantities, uh, for dots, uh, for example, dot patterns. If you ask people to ask which, uh, to discriminate which of two dot arrays is larger in an fMRI scanner, you will see activation. Uh, uh, that is correlated with this task in, in and around the intraparietal sulcus. And this has really painted sort of a story of um, uh, phylogenetic and ontogenetic continuity in the foundational systems underpinning our numerical abilities. And I think this is beautifully illustrated in this slide taken from Melissa Libertas and Elizabeth Brannan's uh, review article um, uh, uh, quite some years ago now, but sort of uh, still a view that I think is widely held or data uh, that is consistent with this view is that um, there are similar brain regions that underpin a sensitivity to non-symbolic numerical quantity in adults and young children, as well as in very young babies. Uh, the example from babies here is an EEG source localization study by Veronique Zard, Stanislas Stahan and colleagues. So all of this data, and I've just shown you a very uh, small selection of that, has led to sort of a, a view that uh, we as humans are born with a sense of non-symbolic quantity that we share with other species. And this has also been uh, referred to as the approximate number system, namely because these representations of numerical quantity are not precise. Uh, they uh, uh, are... Uh, subject to uh, certain effects, such as the ratio effect or the distance effect. As I told you, the six-month-old infants were able to discriminate between 8 and 16, but not 8 and 12, suggesting that a sufficiently large difference between the numerical uh, arrays, between the dot arrays, was necessary for them to be able to discriminate. 
And following on from this uh, sort of consensus in the literature, dominant hypothesis emerged, which is that our symbolic numerical abilities that are uniquely human, such as uh, number words and Arabic numerals or Chinese ideographs or any other symbolic system that you might encounter, that these symbolic systems, which are relatively recent, are grounded in this approximate number system. So in other words, that uh, symbols inherit the uh, signatures of the non-symbolic pre-existing number system and that when we learn symbols, we connect them to this pre-existing system. This is illustrated, for example, in this quote by, uh, from Manuela Piazza, who says that humans are born with strong intuitions on approximate numerical quantities in their relations. There is evidence to suggest that culture-based acquisition, that is the learning of symbols, is grounded on these pre-existing intuitions. And that seems like a very uh, intuitive hypothesis that we have a pre-existing system, an approximate number system, and when we learn symbols over the course of a learning and development, we simply connect the two systems with one another. But I think uh, we need to ask questions about how well the predictions that you might derive from such a hypothesis hold uh, when we look at the available data. So one of the key predictions that's actually been uh, feverishly investigated by laboratories across the planet is um, that if indeed the approximate number system forms the basis or the grounding for our symbolic math abilities, then individual differences in uh, the sort of precision of this approximate number system should map on uh, to individual differences in symbolic number abilities, such as, for example, rudimentary arithmetic or even more basic things, such as being able to tell which of two Arabic numerals is numerically larger. So one might ask then when you take a sample of children and give them a number discrimination task, such as the one on your left hand side, and ask them to judge whether they are more blue or more yellow dots, and then to see whether individual differences in the accuracy with which children are able to do that, whether those explain individual differences in symbolic math abilities. And there have been many, many studies on this topic, and thankfully I don't need to go through all of them because in a relatively recent meta-analysis, Michael Schneider and his colleagues uh, uh, summarized the available data. They looked at 45 peer-reviewed papers that had investigated the correlation primarily cross-sectionally between non-symbolic number discrimination, dot discrimination in most cases, and on the one hand, and symbolic math ability predominantly arithmetic on the other hand. And what they found was that the average correlation between individual differences in non-symbolic number discrimination and arithmetic abilities was uh, significant, the zero order correlation, but it was relatively small, so an R value of 0.21, so a low to moderate association. So that already, uh, I think, casts some doubts on the uh, strong version of a grounding of number symbols in the pre-existing um, approximate number representation. And it also casts doubt as to whether uh, individual differences in non-symbolic number processing can be used in any kind of clinically relevant sense, in the sense that you could use them to uh, identify children who might be at risk. Uh, this is certainly not a correlation of value that I think many clinicians would put a lot of stock into. In addition to the relatively moderate, though significant, zero-order correlation between non-symbolic number processing and math abilities, there's another concern that uh, authors have raised when it comes to doing dot discrimination tasks and using them as an index of an internal uh, representation of approximate number. And I want to illustrate this concern to you by asking you to participate in your own homes in a short experiment. Uh, this is entirely voluntary. There's no way I can take any consent here, and it's a very short experiment, but it's just an illustrative one. What I will show you are two uh, dot arrays. Um, one is, uh, uh, and I will ask you to judge uh, which of the two dot arrays, one will appear on the left-hand side of your screen, the other one on the right-hand side of the screen, which one contains the larger number of dots. Just do so as quickly, as accurately as you can. Um, I won't ask you to shout because you're all muted. Uh, this is a slide from uh, pre-COVID times when we could still uh, uh, do these things. Ding, ding. <laughs> but nevertheless, take a quick judgment for yourself. Uh, 
Okay, I think I was temporarily muted there, so I've unmuted myself again. So here we go with the uh, with the experiment. So here's the first dot array. Judge which one is on the which one is numerically larger, which one contains a large number of dots, and here is the second one. Okay, so one of the things that I didn't tell you about before was that in both cases there were 21 dots on the left and 26 on the right. Uh, I can't ask you right now, but uh, uh, when I've given this talk before, many people say, well, they didn't think that they were the same quantity. And the re uh, there might be a reason for this, which is that these stimuli were manipulated uh, in a particular way. So the first stimuli that you saw, there was a congruency between uh, the area occupied by the dots and the total number of dots. So uh, what you can see here is on the uh, right-hand side, you not only have the larger number, numerical quantity of dots, but they also occupy the larger area and have the larger individual dot size. So in other words, the non-numerical cues such as area and individual item size, overall area and individual item size point to the same decision as numerical quantity. However, the scenario is a little bit different when you look at uh, the second example of uh, these dot arrays, where now there is a conflict or the, there's an incongruency between uh, the numerical quantity of dots and the area that they occupied in the individual item size. And it turns out that uh, people find uh, these incongruent trials, as you might predict uh, from the Stroop literature more generally, much more challenging than the congruent trials. So this raises the question whether one of these trial types drives the correlation between individual differences in non-symbolic number processing and individual differences in symbolic math. Now, many have investigated this. I just want to present you with one finding from our own lab where my former graduate student, Stephanie Bugton, who's now a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, looked at this question in a sample of children with persistent developmental dyscalculia. So these were children who uh, we had followed for a number of years and had uh, good uh, evidence from standardized tests that they were showing persistent difficulties in math, at least 1.5 standard deviation below the population mean. And we were able to control, compare them to a control group of children who had shown persistently good performance in, in math. So we had uh, 15 children between the ages of eight and 13 years of age uh, with persistent developmental dyscalculia. So over time, they showed math deficits. Uh, they didn't just uh, have math problems at one point or look like they had math problems at one point and then recovered. They really had sort of uh, persistent difficulties. And we compared them to 15 age match controls without math difficulties. And in order to investigate their symbolic number processing, we used uh, Justin Halberta's Panamath task. And in this task, you can separate trials where size is controlled versus where size is not controlled. So size controlled would be an incongruent trial because if you can co control the size of two um, uh, arrays that differ in number, necessarily uh, you're going to have to make the dot sizes of the larger array smaller and the non-size control, which would be the congruent version where the numerically larger array of dots would occupy the larger area as well. So what did we find when we separated out these uh, trials into size controlled versus non-size controlled, congruent versus incongruent, and then compared them between the children with and without developmental dyscalculia? Well, what we found is illustrated in this bar graph here. On the y-axis, you can see the Weber fraction. For those of you who are not familiar with Weber fractions, they are an estimate of the precision of the underlying representation. Uh, so a higher value means uh, you have less precise uh, representations if you want. One can also plot this against accuracy and it looks very similar. But what you can see is that there were no group differences uh, for the congruent stimuli. So typically developing children in blue and uh, the uh, developmental dyscalculics in purple did not differ in their Weber fraction. However, as soon as there was a conflict between numerical quantity and physical size, the children with developmental dyscalculia really suffered and had much higher Weber fraction, much, like, less, much more errors they made on this task. So it seems to be the case that uh, children who have extreme symbolic number processing difficulties don't just have a general deficit in these dot discrimination tasks, but they struggle in particular when they have to uh, disambiguate numerical quantity uh, uh, from other conflicting cues such as area or individual item size. 
which may suggest that these uh, dot discrimination tasks are not purely tapping on into an approximate number system and that therefore the correlation between A and S tasks such as dot discrimination in math may not be solely driven by numerical acuity. Another question that we need to ask ourselves when we look at the relationship between non-symbolic number processing and symbolic math abilities is a question about the direction of relationship, which has also been brought up in the reading literature when it comes to phonological awareness and reading, which is, of course, we tend to naturally assume uh, that when we are dealing with things that uh, can be detected very early in life that we share with other species, that they would necessarily form the precursor and that therefore a correlation between non-symbolic number and symbolic math can be interpreted as uh, going from non-symbolic number to symbolic math. But most of the studies in our field are cross-sectional and therefore we need to ask our question, and we need to ask a question about the potential of different directions of relationship or indeed by directionality. And this is nicely summarized in an article by Simon Conway Morris, who says that at first sight, comfort might be given by studies that show how in infants and children there is a positive, albeit weak, correlation between numerosity and mathematical ability. But correlations need neither be directly causal nor necessarily cut only one way. One could argue, for example, that being better at mathematics serves to improve judgments and numerosity. So in order to investigate this uh, hypothesis about the direction of the relationship, one needs uh, ideally uh, longitudinal uh, data with the same uh, measures being uh, uh, taken at each of the different time points. So one direction that is possible is the one that we typically assume, which is that individual differences in non-symbolic number drive the growth in symbolic math abilities. But it's of course also possible that the reverse is true, as Simon Conway Morris postulates that perhaps when you develop better symbolic number abilities that uh, refines the way you're able to look at sets and you're able to identify sets as referring to a single quantity and that, that by that you then strengthen your non-symbolic number processing abilities or indeed that the relationship might be fully bi-directional whereby symbol growth in symbolic number strengthens growth in non-symbolic and the other way around. So we uh, had an opportunity together with uh, Ian Lyons, who was a postdoc in my lab at the time and is now an assistant professor at Georgetown University. We had the ability to look at this question as part of a larger study that we conducted in conjunction with the Toronto District School Board, where we were able to screen children um, in senior kindergarten, that's uh, sort of the, the second year of kindergarten here in Canada, so the children were uh, around five years of age. They came from 35 schools in the Toronto District School Board. And we were able to uh, fortunately test them at the beginning of their senior kindergarten year, as well as towards the end of their senior kindergarten year. And we're currently analyzing a third time point uh, in grade one. We gave them paper and pencil measures of symbolic and non-symbolic number comparison just for practical reasons in order to administer the test relatively rapidly. And uh, this was a larger um, effort, but for the purpose of today, I'll just share the data from symbolic and non-symbolic comparison tasks, which seem most relevant to the question of bidirectionality. For the symbolic number comparison task, they were asked to judge which of the two Arabic numerals is larger and cross out using a pen or a pencil, the larger of the two numbers. For dot comparison, they were asked to do the same, but now judge which of the dots is numerically larger. And they were timed, so they were, the emphasis was given to them not counting and doing this as quickly and accurately as they could. So with this data in hand, what we did is a cross-lagged uh, regression model. We're now following up with, uh, uh, with uh, structural equation model and path analysis because of the well-known limitations um, known of, of these cross-lagged models. Um, but the results so far seem to uh, look very similar with the three points as they do in this modeling with the two time points. So what we found was when we looked at uh, whether non-symbolic at time one, so non-symbolic dot discrimination abilities at the beginning of senior kindergarten, whether they explain variance in uh, symbolic number abilities at the end of senior kindergarten whilst controlling for symbolic number abilities at time one, uh, we found no such relationship. And I think this is really important because traditionally we look at it non-symbolic at time one predicts symbolic at time two, but unless we control for symbolic at time one, we can't really uh, distinguish between really longitudinally predictive effects of how much change does non-symbolic predict in, in symbolic. Um, without controlling for the autoregressive effects. So that's what we did here, inspired by similar work in the domain of reading and many other fields. 
What we found instead was evidence for unidirectionality going in the other direction, whereby symbolic at time one, whilst controlling for non-symbolic at time one, did explain significant individual differences in non-symbolic at time two. So these data sort of are consistent then with Simon, Simon Conway Morris's um, uh, hypothesis that there isn't actually very strong evidence, at least in this data and at this time point in development. Of course, that is an important caveat. We're testing five-year-olds, so who knows what this relationship looks like earlier on. That still needs to be investigated. But at this critical time point in the transition from uh, preschool, kindergarten into early elementary school, we see no evidence for the hypothesis that individual differences in non-symbolic number processing predict change in symbolic number. Instead, we find uh, that the reverse uh, is true. And with our third time point data, uh, there seems to be similar evidence emerging. So um, if we then ask the question, does non-symbolic uh, matter? And do we have strong support, going back to the beginning of my talk, for the notion that individual differences in non-symbolic number predict uh, individual differences in symbolic number, and especially the growth in symbolic number? We don't see evidence for a strong predictor, symbolic, non-symbolic as a strong predictor of individual differences. And therefore, it's likely not for identifying children at risk at this point. Maybe that will change. Uh, we also see that contrary, contrary to previous hypotheses, symbolic predicts change in non-symbolic, but non-symbolic does not predict change developmentally in symbolic. And then there's the question that many have addressed, which is how numerical are these non-symbolic tasks to begin with? the control that might potentially explain the zero order correlations between non-symbolic that are undoubtedly there, the zero order correlations between non-symbolic number processing and math. So there's a lot of open questions here. But if we go back to the beginning and sort of the search for foundational competencies, I think these data and others suggest that uh, perhaps what we need to be doing instead of uh, trying to uh, study dot comparison and dot discrimination tasks and their value is to look more carefully at, uh, at this uniquely human ontogenetic developmental process of learning about numerical symbols. Um, numerical symbols are a human invention. Um, they have been tr transmitted across cultures, across time for about five to 6,000 years. And of course they've evolved uh, tremendously as the left-hand side of my slide uh, seeks to suggest uh, different types of symbolic representations have been developed. And nowadays, uh, most of us uh, use Arabic numerals, and this has really become almost a universal uh, language of math. And children need to go through this process of learning these symbols over developmental time. And this process turns out to be quite complex if we think about it a little bit. So if we think about the learning of numerical symbols, if we take the number symbol five, there's a lot of things that a four to five-year-old and sometimes even younger children need to learn about these symbols. First of all, they need to learn that uh, five each, each five, uh, symbolic five, refers to all sets of a quantity of five, so the sort of the symbol quantity relationship. They also need to learn that uh, symbols are part of a sequence and therefore carry positional or rank information, something that we refer to as ordinality, which allows children to make inferences about symbol-symbol relationships. They also need to learn that uh, symbols are part of a visual category and like letters therefore carry invariants that they can be printed in different font sizes and font types, but they never let's refer to the same uh, um, category, same symbol. And there's lots of work now in uh, cognitive neuroscience trying to identify uh, whether there is something like a visual number form area and there's still some controversy around that. In addition, children need to learn that symbols can be represented in multiple different ways and need to transcode between modalities and types of representation uh, between the visual symbol five, the Arabic numeral, and the spoken number word, between the spoken number word and the written number word, and so forth. So there's a lot of things that children need to learn just about five. And then it gets even more complex when uh, uh, five becomes part of a multi-digit number sequence, where now its place or its position in this multi-digit number sequence determines its value. So this slide is to illustrate that there's a lot of challenges to learning uh, numerical symbols. So how can we assess symbolic skills in the early years and which skills might be particularly important? And I think this is an area of uh, tremendous inquiry where people are looking at now these multiple ways in which we can represent symbols. I'm just going to focus on cardinality. I realize that naming and other things are tremendously important as well. 
But uh, one of the ways we've been going about assessing symbolic number processing in the early years and using it perhaps as a, as a screener, though not as a clinical one, is to give children these paper and pencil tasks, much like the one before where they asked to cross out the larger of two numbers or the uh, larger of two dot arrays. And this is work done by my former graduate student, uh, Nadia Nosworthy. And what Nadia and many others uh, in my lab and other labs have found is that um, this uh, test does correlate with individual differences in arithmetic and does a reasonable job of predicting individual differences in arithmetic over time. If you're interested in the numeracy screener, we've put it online. We're trying to scale this website to include other types of screeners that we've developed. It's completely free of charge. If you have any questions, get in touch with me. But going back to the research, what we've tried to do with this test is to ask whether um, this two minute paper and pencil test um, uh, measured in kindergarten, so at around age five, can predict something about uh, students' future math abilities. In this case, we had access to grade one math grades um, that were given to us by the school board. So we were able to then ask the question, if you give this uh, test to somebody in senior kindergarten at age five, does it tell us anything about how well their teachers think they will do? Uh, later on and is are there any differences between the sort of predictive value of the symbolic versus the non-symbolic version of the test and this is work by uh, Zach Hawes who uh, recently graduated uh, from Western University uh, with his PhD is now an assistant professor at OISE in Toronto and Zach took a lot of data that we had from kindergartners uh, nearly 400 kids and what you can see here is that there's a reasonable correlation between both symbolic and non-symbolic number comparison at the zero order level and math grades and first grades. So kindergarten administered symbolic number comparison, math and symbolic and non-symbolic and math grades in grade one. But interestingly, when you look at uh, um, a multiple regression where you're predicting the first grade math grades using a variety of uh, measures, including symbolic and non-symbolic that we have, but others as well, such as arithmetic and number line, estimation performance, rapid color naming, sentence recall measures put into this by colleagues of mine, Alisa Archibald and Mark Joannis, uh, who I collaborate with, who would use this project to study more language related aspects. But if we put these predictors in, we can see that uh, only symbolic and sentence recall are actually unique uh, predictors of individual differences. Once again, highlighting that um, symbolic is a stronger predictor than non symbolic, and that this measure can be used to explain individual differences in math grades from the symbolic number processing skills measured in kindergarten. Beyond cardinality, uh, we've also been looking at ordinality and its predictive role. Uh, as I said before, Arabic numerals are part of an ordered sequence and therefore carry positional or rank information. One of the ways we and others have been doing it is, is to ask children to simply judge whether three numbers, a triplet of numbers, are in numerical order or not, so with a order verification task, if you like. So for example, one, three, five, the child would respond yes, and three, one, five, that would be out of order. Um, and together with uh, Ian and uh, colleagues at the University of Maastricht uh, some years ago now, we were able to look at uh, the role of ordinality of both number comparisons, so tasks measuring cardinality and triplet order verification ordinality in a group of nearly 1,400 children. So this was cross-sectional -sec cross work, so that's an important caveat. And what we found is illustrated uh, in this slide here. So this is, first of all, in the blue line, what you see is how much uh, of the individual differences in a standardized measure of arithmetic can be explained by a traditional symbolic number comparison task. You can see the effect size on the y-axis and the grades uh, across on the x-axis, uh, noting again that not the same children are in each of those grades, but that this is cross-sectional data. Well, what you can see is that early in, in grades one and two, um, number comparison uh, explains qu quite a lot of individual differences in uh, arithmetic ability, but then its explanatory uh, power declines or its, uh, the correlations become uh, much smaller. Uh, however, when we look at ordinality, we saw something that we didn't expect and that surprises us and still puzzles us. So we don't have a full explanation for this yet, but. When you look at this ordered triplet verification task, what you can see is that early uh, in the early grades, grades one and two, it doesn't actually explain much of individual differences, but by grade six, it's one of the strongest predictors of individual differences in arithmetic. There were a number of other predictors in this model that I'm not showing you here, but you can look at that in the paper or send me an email if you have questions afterwards. 
So um, what these data uh, suggest consistent with the slide with the five is that there are many different aspects to uh, symbolic number processing, that their predicted power um, changes over time, that they're age-related changes, and that these age-related changes might uh, suggest that different aspects of symbolic number representations become important for things like calculation at different points in development. Of course, there'll be other skills such as naming, transcoding, and so forth, um, multi-digit number processing skills that would need to be filled into this slide. So I'm all already almost half, uh, halfway through or more than halfway through, so I'm going to turn now to what we can learn from cognitive neuroscience about the, the question of precursors of number, about the relationship of symbolic and non-symbolic number. Well, as I showed you before, there's quite a lot of evidence that we can see signatures of non-symbolic number processing in the brain from an early age. Uh, we know that the right intraparietal uh, sulcus is responsive to non-symbolic from infancy onwards, work by Veronique Zart and uh, Jessica Kantlon with four-year-old children, Veronique Zart with newborn babies, both suggesting that the right parietal cortex may be sensitive to changes in non-symbolic number. When it comes to symbolic number, we see a lot of evidence from adult studies that symbolic number processing tends to be more left lateralized. Um, and we know from a recent meta-analysis by Mariah Zakolowski, who's a former PhD student uh, from my lab now at the Rotman Research Institute in Toronto, she did an ALE meta-analysis. And uh, what you can see here is um, a contrast where we look at all of the available data from uh, Arabic digit number processing and its neural correlates and dot comparison and its neural correlates, and you can see that there is a, a sort of um, a lateralization difference here, whereby Arabic digits uh, lead to greater activation in the left hemisphere than non-symbolic, and non-symbolic leads to greater activation, in particular in the superior parietal cortex compared to Arabic digits. So one of the ways we've been trying to look at this experimentally beyond um, now, the meta-analysis is to use a paradigm that many of you will be familiar with, which is fMRI adaptation. For those of you who are not, fMRI adaptation uses the well-known uh, physiological phenomenon of stimulus uh, uh, repetition-induced suppression of neuronal signals. So, for example, in many of our studies, what we do is we repeatedly present a six, uh, the Arabic numeral six, in different location, different font sizes, and then we present a number of other numbers, and we look at the degree to which there's a rebound effect. So when you brain regions that uh, um, decrease in their activation to six, presumably are in some way involved in encoding six, uh, either it's perceptual or it's semantic features. And then when we have a rebound effect, we can image which brain regions respond uh, to the change in number. And we can also model the magnitude of that change because we should assume that numbers that are closer to six would lead to smaller um, uh, rebound effect than numbers that are further from six. Uh, we've been able to show that adaptation to symbolic number in the left parietal cortex is uh, somewhat modality independent. So work by Stefan Vogel um, at the University of Graz has shown that uh, you can see um, these adaptation effects to symbolic number, both when they're presented as auditory stimuli, as number words, as well as, as visual stimuli as Arabic numerals. As far as I know, nobody has done yet the cross format of verbal, of auditory and visual, so that's something uh, that remains to be done. One of the questions we asked ourselves recently is, could this have something to do with handedness? Is the lateralization, the left lateralization of symbolic numbers simply a consequence of handwriting experience? And so what we did is we compared left and right handed individuals using our adaptation paradigm. This is work by Celia Goffin, who uh, has recently graduated with a PhD from the lab and is now a postdoc. And what, um, what Stephanie did was to compare a group of left and right handed individuals and we found uh, very small differences between right and left-handed individuals, and certainly not a clear-cut effect of handedness. This would need to be studied in, in even larger samples than we did. But nevertheless, this suggested this simple explanation that the left lateralization of symbolic numbers due to handedness does not necessarily hold, or we don't yet have strong support for it. And there might be other things at, at play, such as the intersection between number and language processing networks in the left hemisphere. One of the things we've been asking very recently, and this is, I think, the last study that I want to share with you, is uh, how differently are symbolic and non-symbolic represented in the brain within subjects? And I highlight here within subjects because most of the data that we have so far, with the exception of a few studies, studies symbolic and non-symbolic numbers separately. So when we looked at 
when Mariah did her meta-analysis, many of the studies don't have a measure of symbolic, comparable measure of symbolic and non-symbolic within subjects. So we're making a lot of inferences in the meta-analysis uh, from uh, looking across studies and therefore making between subjects inferences, which are of course inherently limited. So um, uh, we wanted to uh, design a study uh, where we could look at uh, the brain responses to changes in symbolic and non-symbolic number within the same study. Um, so this is a study that was designed by Zach Hawes and Marais Okolowski in collaboration with one another, and we call this parallel adaptation. Uh, the idea is quite a simple one. What you do is you adapt not just to a single number, but to multiple numbers um, in, 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 in concert. So in this case, we're adapting to four sixes. And this now allows us then to manipulate not only changes in the symbolic uh, magnitudes, which is changing, let's say, from six to eight, but also either decreasing or increasing the number of sixes on the display, uh, which would be a change in non-symbolic number. Now, in order to uh, ensure that participants are attending to the uh, displays, uh, we also had so-called catch trials where uh, the, the symbolic and non-symbolic number would remain uh, the same for sixes, but they would change to blue and participants would have to depress a button inside the MRI scanner. Now, as for the uh, deviants or the stimuli that were interspersed with this train of four sixes, we had uh, three different categories. One of them is a symbolic change where we keep the number of symbols the same, four, but we change the numerical symbol magnitude from six to seven or six to two. We use two different stimuli because now we can manipulate a distance effect. So don't, we don't only look at response to a change, but we look to, uh, to response to a change modulated by distance because we expect on the basis of prior literature that the ch uh, change in response to the distance one change in the brain should be smaller than to the distance four change. We also had a non-symbolic version uh, where now we keep the symbolic magnitude the same, but we either decrease or increase the number of items in the display. And then we had a physical size change where we uh, again kept non-symbolic and symbolic constants of so four sixes, but we either decreased or increased the font size because we were interested in to what extent physical size leads to similar changes in the brain uh, uh, and similar areas that are engaged in non-symbolic and symbolic. So with this, what did we find? What I'm showing you here, this is a, a lot of data, so I'll take you through it. Uh, what I'm showing you here are the distance effects, so contrasting the change in uh, distance four to the change in distance one. Uh, and what you can see here is that for symbolic distance effects, um, they're plotted in green. We can see they're pr predominantly left lateralized uh, in the uh, parietal cortex close to the uh, angular gyrus. For non-symbolic distance effect, we see right lateralization, um, in particularly in the right IPS, as well as bleeding into the right superior parietal cortex. And then for physical size effects, we see changes in the visual cortex, which are to be expected given that the uh, size is either decreasing or increasing. But interestingly, we also see changes in the right parietal cortex, which are closely intertwined with the changes for non-symbolic distance effects. So this then suggests that um, uh, in a design where you within subjects uh, probe uh, the brain's response to changes in symbolic and non-symbolic, they're different. They uh, follow the predicted lateralization patterns, and there seems to be an intermingling of physical size and non-symbolic distance effects. We probe this further using representational similarity analysis, and as you can see from this multidimensional scaling plot, there is a much greater similarity in terms of multivariate patterns between changes in physical size or physical size distance effect and non-symbolic distance effect, and symbolic seems to be quite far apart from that, again, suggesting that this is evidence for not only spatial separation, but also represent, uh, separation in terms of representational patterns for symbolic, but representational patterns for physical size and non-symbolic are similar, and they are both different from a symbolic numerical magnitude. So to summarize, I hope what I've shown you today is that there are data to suggest that the approximate number system is maybe not as strong a stronger predictor of individual differences as assumed some years ago, and therefore may not be as foundational as assumed. Symbolic number processing in its various forms turns out to be quite a strong predictor of individual differences, but we need to pay attention to the multiple different forms of symbolic number comparison, uh, number processing. I think we've been too biased by just looking at comparison. 
Uh, we see a dissimilarity of brain activation patterns, both on the spatial level, but also it's at the multivariate representational level. And this, of course, uh, returns us to the simple grounding problem, which we started out, which we, which we thought we had a simple solution to that symbols uh, acquire their meaning by being attached to these pre-existing approximate number systems. I want to uh, propose a different hypothesis that is uh, aligned with uh, the writings of people like Raphael Nunes and also Susan Carey and David Barner, which is to question whether symbols need to be perceptually grounded in the first place, whether this strong assumption that we had that we need to find a perceptual grounding is actually warranted. So the dominant hypothesis is this one here. We're born with some kind of sense uh, of number, non-symbolic number that we know we share with other species. We know they uh, develop early, can be detected uh, in newborn infants and six-month-old infants as well, and uh, that these eventually map onto our symbolic number abilities. Now, I don't want to question the ex existence of some kind of uh, proto-quantitative system in the brain uh, that indeed has a long evolutionary history and has uh, some sense of identity continuity. But I would like to advocate that uh, learning number symbols is much more of a developmental problem, much more of a learning problem, and therefore actually resembles reading perhaps to a greater extent than we previously thought because symbolic numbers are recent, they are cultural system. Each and every child needs to learn the, them. And for those of you who have worked with two to three year old children or have had two to three year old children or are currently working with them intensely at home as you're struggling to homeschool, you will know that uh, sim learning symbolic number is far from trivial and can take many years as we know very well from the counting literature. And then that children then learn to um, uh, pair those concrete uh, exact representations of number derived through counting with symbolic representations such as Arabic numerals and then eventually use those representations to do complex things in their minds such as mental arithmetic. And that instead of the non-symbolic approximate system constraining the symbolic system is that you have the symbolic systems actually affecting how humans view sets around the world, how they uh, direct their attention to sets in the world that are enriched by having these culturally based symbolic representations of number. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the organizations that generously funded, funded this work, all the people and many more who worked on these projects, and uh, especially the, the school boards, in particular the Toronto District School Board, as well as the Thames Valley District School Board for Education here in, uh, in the London, Ontario region, without whom this work would not have been possible. So thanks very much. I guess I'll hand over to uh, Fumiko now. I'm going to try, I try to unmute during the demo time and that's where I mistakenly muted you as well, but there was some echo because I wanted people to be able to shout out. I'm going to try to unmute everyone in case people wanted to clap. All right. All right. I muted back everyone except for Daniel because I know there was a lot of fun noise in the background which represents the current state of the situation with everyone right now. Um, thank you very much for the fantastic talk. It was uh, great to be um, get a full hour from you. So we're very excited. There's a number of questions that has come in. So I'm going to read them. I'm not very good at summarizing this, but I will uh, go in order. Is there any effective treatment or strategy for children who are facing mathematical difficulties? And this is by Sumik De Dipta. Um, well, I think um, there, there, there are a number of evidence-based strategies that you could look at. You know, I would start with something like looking at the World Works Clearinghouse um, website by the Department of Education, Institute of Education Sciences in the United States. You'll be able to find uh, different math programs that have been assessed using randomized control trials. Um, I think there's some other uh, really great resources depending on the age group. Um, you know, the, the website understood.org provides a lot of really valuable information on various learning and attention challenges. Um, yeah, the What Works Clearinghouse, um, the work by uh, Doug Clemens and others on learning trajectories if you're looking for younger children would be something to look at. I think there's a, there's a lot of resources out there uh, and growing number of resources um, 
that can be used and that are you know evidence informed if not evidence based got it great thank you another question or rather comment this is from florence buhali a postdoc in our lab it's she says it's vaguely or oh maybe she, i was okay it was meant for me a lot of people <laughs> are sending me questions you. a lot of people are sending me questions but she's <laughs> a comment about our pilot and how that is Sorry. consistent and consistent with yours so we're going to check in with you separately daniel on this yeah um, <laughs> right. thank you florence okay another uh question question about lateralization the right parietal effect for non-symbolic number representation is quite well acknowledged in the literature in terms of the specific locations, such as the horizontal segment of the IPS in quite several adaptation habituation studies and the superior parietal region from population receptive field studies by Ben Harvey. But the left lateralized effects mentioned in this task do not seem to point to the IPS or surrounding regions consistently. It's quite a lot of studies involving arithmetic operations or fact retrieval have implicate the left angular gyrus and super marginal gyrus. So how do you relate those effects, the IPL and SMG, to activation in the left IPS? Yeah, I think that's a really good question and something that we're still struggling with. I think in the in the task where we do uh, adaptation work, um, we typically do find left IPS, but uh, the, the question is absolutely right in that when we look at mental arithmetic and look at more fact retrieval, I think we and others have definitely seen uh, uh, things in, 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 in the angular gyrus. So I'm not really sure how we can fully reconcile those findings at the moment. I wonder whether um, the IP, left IPS is more engaged when there's a greater demand on quantity manipulation and on actually the representation of the cardinality in the ordinality and when the left angular gyrus is almost like a symbol referent mapping regions where when you see a highly overland arithmetic fact that allows you to immediately access that memory. But I think perhaps there's some more within subject studies that we need to do in order to get to the bottom of this. Got it, thank you. Um, a question from William Snyder at UConn. Could you comment on the role of the count list as described in work of Mary Coppola with deaf individuals using a home sign system? I have to, I have to read up on that. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to offer an answer without having read that work. All right, great. Perhaps William can uh, connect with you separately another That'd time. Bruce McCandless from Stanford. He has a question, a uh, comment, great talk resonance completely with my thinking on this. Can you expand upon how symbol learning tight, tightens non-symbolic accuracy? Would pedagogy that stresses mapping symbol and quantity drive this more rapidly than fact retrieval? Yeah, so I, I'm, I, the way I think about it is that um, a symbolic representation allows children to ignore information that conflicts with numerical quantity. So I think, and we haven't got direct evidence for this, I still want to do this study, whether growth in symbolic number actually reduces the uh, conflict effects that we see in the non-symbolic task. That would be my prediction, that as your symbolic number abilities grow, you're better able to distinguish number from the naturally correlated things such as area and density. And there's some evidence from Barbara Zanecker's work and James Negan's work uh, a few years ago, published in the British Journal of Educational Psychology uh, or Developmental Psychology, I can't remember which one. But what they showed was that when kids learn to count, when they learn uh, the cardinality principle, it's only those kids that have the cardinality principle that can actually do non-symbolic number discrimination when there's a conflict, which I think is sort of indirect evidence for this notion that symbolic number allows children to override some of these conflicting variables and focus in on the number because now they've got a single descriptor for a set. So that's how I think it might um, change the set-based representation. I do think that work, of course, you know, in the whole spirit of um, concrete representational abstract shift in math development, it is important, obviously, to work on symbolic and non-symbolic um, pairings and to uh, to teach them in conjunction with one another and to draw children's attention as well to the to the to to things like the conflict between number and other variables. I don't know if that answers Bruce's question. Great. Um, 
follow up from Bruce, what do you make of cross -nash notational transfer in fMRI? How does that jive with your current thinking? Cross notational transfer. Uh, so do you mean like between Chinese numerals and Arabic numerals or? I unmuted Bruce. <laughs> Oh, yeah, sorry. If you habituate to uh, a dot value and then there's transfer to a close numeric value. Yeah, so I mean, the, the study that I know that did, there's two studies that I know that did that, one of them by Manuela Piazza and Neuron in 2004, and they were able to show these uh, cross notational effects. Uh, but there was some asymmetry between them in that that suggested that the symbolic number system is more precise. And then there's one that I think hasn't received quite the attention that it should by Roy Cohn Kadosh, which sort of suggests that the um, the, the non-symbolic adaptation effects may not be as quantitative in nature as we previously thought. But I have to go back to that study to give you the precise details. Those are the two that I know cross cross notation effects. Um, I personally haven't tried any cross notation adaptation yet. Great, thank you. Marie Coppola just sent a comment saying that her first paper related to that project is just about to be submitted, so stay tuned. And then she says, oh right, the home sign work is published though. The work we plan to submit is with deaf and hard of hearing children in the United States. So there seems to be something relevant that's published already. And then I'm going to switch to Linda Siegel's questions that were submitted earlier from University of British Columbia before the talk. But what systems task should be used with young children to determine who is at risk for mathematical difficulties was question number one. Yeah, thanks, Linda, and, and nice to hear from you. Um, I, honestly, I don't think we have great clarity on, on what are the best assessments for young children? If I would have to go with one that I know that is standardized and published, it would be Nancy Jordan's uh, uh, number sense screener. Uh, there's also the Dibbles assessment that I think a lot of school psychologists use, uh, which, has, um, which has a number of number sense um, assessments. If you're looking at more international context, the early grade math assessment test also has some standardized components. So those are the ones where I know that the psychometric properties have been properly checked, but there may be others as well. I know that David Popper has been working on a number of measures for early math and also Bert de Smet has a, uh, what, what's called the SIM test that I think is in psychological methods, which is also a paper and pencil test that has been quite well validated for, for young children between the ages of five and six. Um, great. Let me look at her other questions. She had two more questions. No, I can't find them. Oh, question two. What is the best way to monitor progress in mathematics? And what's your opinion of jump math? I think the second question I can answer more easily is the first one. The first one there's so I think I guess it depends on what math what math you uh, what, what what math you mean to monitor progress. Um, I think there's a variety of measures. Um, in early math, I would go with things like the uh, number sense screener. I don't know about later math that much. When it comes to my opinion of jump math, I think um, there is a, a recent um, randomized control trial that was published in PLOS One by Tracy Solomon and colleagues that showed some promising results from a relatively large Canadian uh, sample, especially when it came to gains in math fluency over and above business as usual. Um, I think one of the strengths that I see in jump math is that it is uh, very well sequenced. And I also see one particular strength in jump math is the teacher guide. So uh, not only does it have very strong uh, workbooks for students, but it also has teacher guides that I have heard from many teachers who've tried jump math are very helpful because it provides a very clear uh, sequencing for them and allows them to engage in explicit instruction uh, quite easily. And this may be particularly useful for teachers who uh, don't feel very confident in their math teaching abilities that uh, they are provided with a great deal of structure and how to 
put together their lessons. Um, we're, we're collaborating with Jump Math right now and hoping, you know, when, when, when it's possible again to do some research, some further research on the efficacy of the program. And our focus will be particularly on how it affects uh, students' math anxiety uh, because that hasn't yet been explored. Great. Let me just check. Oh, and, uh, there's a couple more questions that came in if you have a couple more minutes. Sure. Um, Emily Kerrigan sent a question. In testing non-symbolic representations in children, many of us use pen and math, but there has been some discussions among the group of us working with Marie Coppola, including Stacy Santos, who ha was the first person I heard discuss this, that pen and math may not be entirely about non-symbolic representations because the track task directions include asking participants to judge which side has more, a symbol that has some degree of quantity information in it and which kids need to learn. Have you thought about this? Yeah, uh, a lot. And I think a lot of people have, have and uh, it's not, it's, these problems are not unique to Panama. I think they, they're, they're general to any non-symbolic comparison task is that, um, I mean, I always think it's very difficult to measure purely non-symbolic comparison as soon as you are dealing with participants who have symbolic number representations. Because as soon as they have symbolic number representations, you can't be sure that they're not using those in order to do the non-symbolic task. So that's, that would be my first point. And the second point would be the congruency effects that I've talked about, which again are not unique to Panama. Uh, so I'm not trying to criticize that task in particular. They're, 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 they're sort of general to all non-symbolic comparison tasks. So those are two things that I would watch out for and just to be cautious in one's interpretation of this as something that can be put in direct equivalence with data from infants and, and animals. Just because as soon as you test uh, uh, children who've got, gained some kind of symbolic literacy, it's going to be difficult to disconfound that from a purely nonverbal approximate number system. Great, thank you. Mary Coppola followed up with a comment saying, Stacy Santos presented results at last year's Mathematical Cognition Learning Society conference, showing that deaf children's understanding of the word more related to their Panamath uh, non-symbolic performance, and she's happy to share the poster. Mm -hmm. um, and then a question from Nadine Gab from Boston Children's Hospital. Thank you for the excellent talk with a big exclamation mark. Where do you see the main overlap between reading and arithmetic or math development? Yeah, it's, it's funny you should ask that, Nadine. I, I thought we were going to study that together, but uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure where. I, I think this is a really, really important and big question that many people are now starting to investigate. Um, I can, I mean, I can only throw out some, some suspicions. I think probably the left temporal cortex might be very important anatomically in terms of the overlap between reading and math. There may also be other regions and networks that are critical for this. I think the idea uh, of, of going from symbol to referent, uh, from symbolic to non-symbolic, or from uh, grapheme to phoneme is something that reading and math share. But so far, the studies of comorbidity of reading and math haven't really come to an underlying cause. Maybe we need to look at something even deeper than that. I think you know something like procedural learning, which Dorothy Bishop and Michael Ullman and others have proposed as potential latent factors underlying comorbidities. I think this is a really important question because for so long we've been treating them relatively in isolation. And, and finally, I think the fields are coming together and hopefully one day there'll be a joint meeting between MCLS and the the, the the, what is the triple SR? Triple um, SR, yes. I saw yeah. Charles Hume on the call early on the video earlier, so maybe he's listening to that also. I know he's been central to triple SR. A question from Eileen Yi on um, from Yukon. She says, Thank you. When you question the need for non symbolic grounding of symbolic numeracy, are you simply meaning to highlight the interactivity of the two systems in bracket and in particular the influence of symbolic numeracy? on non-symbolic numeracy, close bracket, or are you also suggesting the symbolic system become independent of the non-symbolic one? I, I, I think both are possible. I don't know whether we can come strongly on, on one side yet. Uh, I tend to hold a little bit more of a radical view these days or, uh, or a view that, that posits that uh, the approximate number system as it is traditionally conceived doesn't have much to do with symbolic number development. 
And that symbolic number development is in, in essence for me a learning problem and a developmental problem. Because we also see that symbolic numbers are not universal across this planet. We know from work by Dehan Nunes and others, uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Sachs at, at Berkeley, that there are cultures that don't have symbolic number because there's no cultural pressure on them to develop those symbolic number systems. So I think I, I tend to nowadays think about symbolic number development as much more of a learning cultural and developmental issue rather than one that just has to do with perceptual grounding. Some perceptual grounding may be necessary, but it may not be the approximate number system in the way we traditionally thought about it. But I don't have a strong, I don't think the data are strong enough yet to come down on either side of what you described. Great. Thank you very much. I think we are done covering all the questions. Thank you for taking the time. And I know if you were excited about his work today, he's an avid twit tweeter, I guess. He has over 6,000 followers and he um, tweets a lot of useful information. So I would highly recommend following Daniel. And um, hope we can do this another time in a couple of weeks and we will send out information. You can join our list server or follow us as well. So thank you very much. Daniel, do you have any final comments before you go or you have to get back to just, child duty? Just, just be well, everybody, and, and take good care of yourselves. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rameka, for organizing. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Bye.